we are all going through a rough time. Many of our colleagues are already deep into the battle against the coronavirus disease, trying to save as many lives as they can, and many of us are preparing for the same. I am Dr. Mithun, faculty in emergency medicine from Government Medical College, Koriko. Today, I like to talk about some steps or strategies that has to be taken or already have been taken in some centers to make the hospital system, particularly the emergency department, be better prepared to handle the COVID-19 epidemic. What that matters and challenging for us at this phase of the COVID-19 epidemic in India is how we are going to treat the COVID-19 patients while preventing the transmission of this infection to the healthcare personnel as well as other non-COVID suspect patients. Because we know that hospitals can act as amplification centers during an epidemic, even when the rest of the country is under lockdown. A nosocomial infection rate as high as 41% has been reported by the Chinese. When it comes to infection transmission prevention, it's always about risk reduction. You cannot absolutely eliminate the risk unless you isolate yourself without seeing any patients and that's not an option for us. At least some of us might be thinking, we got our PPEs, so we must be safe. But the fact is that the safety offered by PPEs is highly dependent on the fit as well as how you use it. If you look at the hierarchy of controls essential for worker safety, you can see that PPEs are the least effective ones compared to the other methods of control. So I would say that PPEs are your basic requirement. The importance of PPEs cannot be overstated. But the best method is to always have a combination of controls so that even if one of them fails, the other one will back you up. One thing to remember is that when you're working in a hospital, it's not just your safety you need to consider. You have to ensure the safety of all the healthcare personnel, which includes all the paid as well as the unpaid persons who provide the services in the healthcare setting, who have the potential for direct or indirect exposure to patients or the infectious materials. You have to prevent the non-COVID patients from getting infected from the hospital and you have to prevent the false COVID suspects who may not really have the disease but some other respiratory infection or came to the hospital for some other non-respiratory complaints. And finally, you need to treat the COVID tested positives, maybe refer to your sender as well as the true COVID suspects. So just see how many classes of people you need to consider. First of all, you, the most important person. Now, the other healthcare personnel, COVID tested positives, true COVID suspects who really have the infection, but we haven't diagnosed them yet. Then false COVID suspects whom we are suspecting to have the infection, but they may really not have them. Then the true non-COVID suspects and finally the dangerous class, the false non-COVID suspects who may really have the infection but we are not suspecting them based on our criteria. And sometimes unfortunately they may give false information regarding the travel or contact. So we shouldn't take a chance and take necessary precautions even when caring for all these people. So let's just quickly go through some of the engineering and administrative controls which may be deployed depending on the capability of your hospital as well as the stage of the epidemic. Engineering controls is all about isolation of people from the hazard. Triaging is the most important step in this. We need to segregate COVID suspects from the non-COVID suspects at the first triage point itself. So this has to be set up somewhere outside the emergency department at your hospital's single entry point. This point should be somewhere with a lot of space, ventilation and some sort of barrier between the patient and the bystander 
and the screening healthcare personnel. Patients don't have to be even boarded off the vehicle for this. This segregation has to be based on the national as well as the state guidelines which defines a COVID suspect. And this definition will get amended multiple times based on the stage of the outbreak in your community. After identifying COVID suspects, give all of them a surgical mask to wear and you need to isolate them from the non-COVIDs. Physical barrier is the best way to do this. You can have separate buildings, one for COVID and the other for non-COVID or just separate areas in the same building with different entry and exit points. If your hospital has been designated as a dedicated COVID center, you need to have separate triage systems within these areas to prioritize patients based on their vitals. But ensure that these areas have separate HVAC systems or the air conditioning systems if your building is already having one. The area that has been dedicated for COVID suspects also varies according to the spread of the disease in your locality. So initially, you may have dedicated just a couple of rooms only for a COVID suspect. But as the number of patients who are COVID suspects coming to your ED increases, you need to dedicate more number of rooms for this. If you run out of rooms, then you need to find a common large area for these people. Now, sometimes your hospital may have to receive COVID patients who are already tested positives. Isolation room is a must for the COVID positive patients. If there are not enough rooms and all the positives are being treated at your center, then isolation wards where you can cohort such patients can be used. So now we have separated the COVID suspects from others. But one thing you need to remember is that within the COVID suspects itself, there are true COVID suspects who really have the infection and false COVID suspects who may not have the infection. Now, how to isolate the true COVID suspects from the false COVID suspects? It's impossible to differentiate the two without testing them. So what we can do is to provide isolation rooms for all the suspects. That would be the ideal way to prevent the transmission. Now, if you don't have isolation rooms, the next best thing is to provide some kind of barrier between patients, like curtains, and have at least six feet, that's about two meters distance between the beds. This is to reduce the risk of droplet transmission. But then again, we don't know for sure if there is a person to person airborne transmission in COVID infections. Whether aerosols or droplet nuclei or something called as micro droplets are produced from a patient when he coughs or sneezes or even talks loudly. We don't know that yet. We are not sure about that. But it's for sure that certain interventions that we do in the emergency department produces a lot of aerosols. These include nebulization, opening suctioning of the respiratory tract, non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal cannula, tracheal intubation, bronchoscopy, and CPR. The problem with aerosol is that it can remain suspended in the air for a longer time and can be transmitted through the air for a longer distance. So should we stop doing all these interventions? Many of these are life-saving interventions which we cannot opt not to do. That's where the roles of airs come in. Air is for airborne infection isolation room. And it is recommended that you do all your aerosol generating procedures in such rooms. These are ideally negative pressure rooms, which means that even if you keep the door, room door open, the contaminated air from inside the room doesn't go to the corridor. It is usually exhausted directly to the outside where the contaminated air gets diluted with the fresh atmospheric air. And this reduces the risk of transmission by dilution. But what if you don't have negative pressure rooms? Then the option would be to do the procedure in a closed room 
and have some sort of local exhaust like an exhaust fan or a window open to the outside where pedestrians are restricted in the immediate area. You need to remember that. But again, the central air conditioning is going to be a problem because the contaminated air will be recirculated to the other areas as well. So you need to have either HEPA filters in your exhaust duct or use split ACs in these rooms. If there is no air conditioning at all, try to minimize the number of times you open the door and keep the room closed most of the time. If there are no isolation rooms at all, then the only option is to have an area with a lot of cross ventilation. I tell you, it's all about risk reduction as much as you can. All this is so confusing. So it's always better if you get the opinion from the engineers who deal with this sort of stuff before choosing any area. Now, what about the non-COVID area? How to isolate the false non-COVIDs whom we cannot identify from the true non-COVIDs? It would be great if your ED had separate cubicles for each patient, but that's not the case in majority of our hospitals. So again, curtains, six feet distancing between beds, and having HEPA filters, which by the way are not cheap at all, in your centralized AC ducts would help. Now, let's move on to administrative controls. Administrative controls is all about changing the way people work. This includes limiting the number of healthcare personnel getting exposed to the COVID patients. Divide your workforce into three. One for the COVID area and the other for the non-COVID area. The last group will be your backup in case a surge of COVID patients happen. Only those healthcare providers who are absolutely necessary to handle the load of patients should be there. The next important step is to reduce your exposure to the patient. Once a patient has been isolated, reduce the number of times you go near the patient. You can use two-way communication systems like mobile phones, walkie-talkies, and observe the patient using cameras from your workstation. Third most important step is reducing aerosol generation and dispersion. Reduce aerosol generating procedures like nebulization. Use alternatives like MDIs with spacer. Reduce the use of non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal oxygenation and intubation. Can we really do that? People are dying because of respiratory failure and we cannot save them without ventilating them. So what we need to do is we have to modify the way we do these procedures to minimize aerosol generation and to minimize aerosol diffusion. I tell you again, it's all about risk reduction. 